the U.S., India, and around the world, people who are gay, transgender, or who fail to conform to gender norms are subject to fierce condemnation and widespread discrimination. They're often portrayed as being deviant, perverted, or sinful. These vehement sentiments are supported by passages found in the main scriptures of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim. The Old Testament of the Bible says, if a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions, and he decries the men and women who lust after those of their own sex. In the Quran, the prophet Lot rebukes the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, saying, do you commit abominations such as no people in creation ever committed before? You practice your lusts on men in preference to women. You are indeed a people transgressing beyond bounds. Hinduism is based on the four Vedas, the Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva. Nowhere in those ancient scriptures do we find any explicit references to homosexuality. The Vedas neither condemn nor condone same-sex relationships. But later scriptures, especially the Dharma Shastras, do indeed consider this matter. The Dharma Shastras are collections of religious rules and principles uh, compiled by the holy sages. The best known of them is the Manava Dharma Shastra, or Manu Smriti, that's about 2,000 years old. It says, a twice-born man who has sex with a man or has sex with a woman in an ox cart, in water, or during the daytime, shall bathe dressed in his clothes. This passage prescribes taking a ritual bath for the sake of religious purity after engaging in certain kinds of sexual activity. It doesn't actually condemn sex between males. Then, with regard to women, the Manusmriti says, a woman who has sex with a virgin shall have her head shaved or two fingers cut off and be made to ride a donkey. This is a more severe penalty, but the offense here is not sex between women, but rather corrupting a young girl and thus making her less desirable for marriage. The Manusmriti prescribes a similar penalty for men who rob a girl of her virginity. Like the prior passage, this statement doesn't actually condemn same-sex relationships. Instead, it prohibits sexual activities that cause harm to someone. As you may know, in Hinduism, the main principle of righteousness or dharma is ahimsa, harmlessness. Any sexual activity, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, is considered adharmic or sinful if it causes harm to anyone. Based on all this, we can conclude that the main scriptures of Hinduism don't condemn homosexuality, nor do they condone it. Instead, they seem to take a neutral position. To understand why, consider how the Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures place great emphasis on spiritual values like tolerance, equanimity, and on graceful acceptance of things that can't be changed. The Gita famously says, Samatvam yoga uchyate. Yoga is equanimity. Properly understood, 
Equanimity is to refrain from judging all the people, things, and events in life to be either good or bad. These two words are problematic because what's good for you might be bad for someone else, and vice versa. Good simply means what you like, and bad means what you don't like. In Sanskrit, these two notions are called raga and dvesha, attraction and aversion, or more simply, likes and dislikes. Raga and dvesha compel you to chase after whatever you think is good and to run away from whatever you think is bad. These two urges keep your attention firmly fixed on worldly matters and prevent you from gaining a higher spiritual perspective. Raga and dvesha are huge obstacles to spiritual growth. To overcome them, you have to drop your habitual judgments of good and bad. You have to develop equanimity. You need an impartial, unbiased, and completely objective view of life. Let me explain. Red hair and freckles are neither good nor bad. They're neither desirable nor undesirable. They just are. They're natural. Even though red hair and freckles aren't too common, they happen to be part of the world in which we live, part of God's creation. You have equanimity towards red hair and freckles because you understand that they're natural parts of God's creation. This very perspective is the basis for having equanimity towards people who are gay or transgender. Like red hair and freckles, gay and transgendered people are also natural parts of God's creation. Then, to judge such people as being undesirable or defective in any way is absolutely incorrect. Judgments like these are based purely on personal bias. Now, many people reject the view that being gay or transgender is a natural part of creation. They consider male and female sex roles to be categorically separate and rigidly fixed. They maintain that same-sex relationships and gender nonconformity are unnatural. They're aberrations, opposed to nature, willfully chosen by people who are misguided or perverse. But scientists have come to the opposite conclusion. Studies in botany, zoology, and medical science all show that nature has no fixed boundaries between male and female, no rigid separation of the genders. Instead, nature is rich in complexity. It teems with diversity, including gender diversity. For example, many plants, along with some kinds of fish and reptiles, are hermaphroditic. That is, they have both male and female reproductive organs. So, they're not exclusively male or female. Also, homosexual behavior is exhibited by many kinds of animals, including birds, sheep, elephants, and perhaps most significantly, bonobo apes that are genetically quite similar to us. <laughs> Among humans, one in 1,500 babies is born with some kind of intersex condition in which their anatomy is not typically male, nor is it typically female. In some cases, babies are born with both male and female sex organs. So, nature's great diversity blurs the distinction between male and female more frequently than you might think. Today, as many as 5% of people in the U.S. identify themselves as being gay. 
one in 200 people identify as being transgender. All mainstream medical and health organizations have ceased to consider being gay or transgender as psychological disorders. Most of them now say that sexual orientation and gender identity is innate. It's something we're born with, something that can't be changed. And it's not a matter of choice, as some people claim. According to science, we're born either male or female because of genetics, because of the X and Y chromosomes we inherit from our parents. Recent medical research has found that genetics also has a role in determining a person's sexual orientation and gender identity, though no particular gene seems to be involved. According to the doctrine of karma, we're born male or female because of prarabdha karma, the results of actions committed in past lives. And it's possible that prarabdha karma also determines one's sexual orientation and gender identity. However you choose to look at it, all this diversity is natural. It's part of God's creation. The rishis, the sages of ancient India, didn't have access to the scientific evidence we discussed earlier. But apparently, they understood intuitively that being gay or transgender is natural, part of God's creation. The Manu Smriti describes the biological process that determines a baby's sex like this. When male seed predominates, a boy is born. When female seed predominates, a girl is born. When neither predominates, when both are similar in strength, a non-male is born. Or boy and girl twins are born. The Sanskrit word used here, apuman, literally means not male. And it describes one who is neither male nor female. The word napumsaka, or neuter, is much more common and has exactly the same meaning. So, according to the rishis, human beings are of three sexes, male, female, and napumsaka, which is the third gender, or tritiya prakriti. This is an umbrella term that includes all unconventional sexual orientations and gender identities, as well as intersex conditions. The scriptures composed in ancient India all assumed this threefold view of gender. For this reason, it's not surprising to find in those scriptures many examples of gender diversity. For example, Several Puranic scriptures portray Lord Shiva as Ardha Nadishwara, a bi gender deity whose right half is Lord Shiva and whose left half is Goddess Parvati. This divine form unites the male principle, Purusha, with the female principle, Prakriti. Ardha Nadishwara is worshipped in most temples dedicated to Lord Shiva. The Bhagavata Purana tells the famous story of Lord Vishnu assuming the alluring form of Mohini, the goddess of enchantment. When demons seize the nectar of immortality away from the gods, Lord Vishnu adopted this female persona to infatuate the demons and retrieve the sacred nectar from them. Traditional Vaishnava teachers tell stories about Lord Krishna roaming in the groves of Vrindavan dressed in female attire. He mischievously presented himself as a gopi and sweetly exchanged clothes with his beloved Radha, all as part of his divine play. 
his Leela. In the Mahabharata, the great warrior Arjuna spent 12 months hiding in the kingdom of Virata, disguised as a female dance teacher named Brihanalla. The Padma Purana tells another story about Arjuna. He wanted to know about the gopis who played with Lord Krishna in the forests of Vrindavan. So Krishna told him to go there and find out for himself, after first worshipping goddess Devi. The goddess arranged for Arjuna to bathe in a special pond, and after emerging from its magical waters, he was astonished to find himself totally transformed into a beautiful young gopi named Arjuna. The gopis of Vrindavan shared their secrets with Arjuna and led her to a secret grove where she would again meet Lord Krishna. The point here is none of these stories found in Hindu scriptures contain any ridicule or condemnation of gender nonconformity. In fact, they're quite positive in character. Since Hindu culture is based on these very scriptures, you might wonder why it is that people who are gay or transgender are subject to so much ridicule and condemnation in India today. Many scholars have concluded that this particular social bias is largely the result of foreign influence in the past influence that's only now beginning to wane. Muslims ruled India for centuries. Then the British ruled until India's independence in 1947. Over the years, Islamic and Christian rulers imposed their biased attitudes on their Indian subjects, and that bias gradually became assimilated into the local culture. For example, the British instituted a law against sodomy that was later incorporated into India's penal code. That law was finally struck down in 2018, and same-sex relations are no longer a criminal offense in India. Also, the Supreme Court of India has recently recognized the third gender, so Legal documents like passports now offer a third option in addition to male and female. Yet, because that foreign influence has been so pervasive, it seems to have affected many Hindu teachers and religious leaders in India, both in years past and in modern times. Some contemporary religious teachers think that homosexuality is a Western phenomenon that has slowly crept into Hindu culture. One of the most popular spiritual teachers in India today, excuse me for not naming him, says that being gay is just a tendency, a tendency that can fade away with time. An extremely popular yoga teacher claims that he can cure homosexuality with yoga practice. These views, of course, are incorrect for the reasons we saw before. As modern scientific perspectives become better understood in India, perhaps newer generations of religious teachers will abandon these outdated notions that sadly perpetuate discrimination and oppression. Over the years, I've been called upon to provide counseling and support to families and individuals struggling with these issues. Years ago, two extremely distraught Hindu parents sought my help after their son said he was gay. They asked me to meet their son and convince him to be heterosexual again. As gently and compassionately as I could, I tried to explain to them everything we've discussed here. Unfortunately, their minds seem completely closed. 
they couldn't accept anything I said, perhaps because they were so deeply conditioned by the anti-homosexual bias of the culture in India where they were raised. They left feeling angry and sad. I also felt sad because this issue was likely to rip their family apart and create a rift that might never be healed. On another occasion, the youngest son of a Hindu family I knew quite well introduced me to his male partner. I asked him how his parents had reacted when he came out as being gay. I was delighted to learn that they were completely supportive. His Indian grandparents, on the other hand, weren't so accepting. But his mother and father were committed to bring understanding and acceptance to the entire extended family. These two very different anecdotes show the importance of proper understanding and the terrible consequences of clinging to outdated and misguided views. To accept those who are gay or transgender doesn't in any way whatsoever condone promiscuous or otherwise harmful sexual behavior. Such behavior is adharmic. But it's also a dharmic to ridicule or condemn those who fail to conform to social norms. To understand nature's great diversity and to recognize Hinduism's acceptance of that diversity can help remove the stigma that causes so much suffering and help us all live in harmony. <laughs>